Hello everybody and welcome to the Learn Hittite channel and today I would like to take some moments to talk to you about an article which has been spoken about a lot recently. The title of the article is Language Trees with Sampled Ancestors Support a Hybrid Model for the Origin of Indo-European Languages. It was published recently in July 2023 by Hegarty and his colleagues and it was published in Science which is a pretty well-respected publication. I wanted to talk about this because a lot of um, you know my peers are talking about it and giving their commentary on it um, and also because it really got on my nerves this article did and since rebooting this channel I've wanted to talk about this article but I wanted to wait until I calmed down slightly and I wanted to wait until people who are more knowledgeable about genetics gave their input because it attempts to incorporate genetics into their linguistic model and even though I, I, I know something about uh, genetics from an amateur level, you know, in terms of my personal uh, genetic makeup, ancestry testing, uh, family trees and stuff like this, haplogroups, autosomal DNA, I'm definitely not an expert. Um, and in terms of that fine grain analysis of the genetic components of ancient DNA, I will make way for the opinions of other people that I, I, I respect. And I wanted to get those opinions and, and see what they had to say about the article, which interestingly wasn't positive. So where to begin when talking about this article? So why did it get on my nerves so much? Well, it got on my nerves because me and my wife this year have both been working very hard attempting to get our own academic work published. Myself as an independent researcher and my wife was part of a medical research team uh, in a local university where we live. And it's very difficult to get published. You know, um, you need good data, good conclusions, uh, a well-written article put together, and it needs to be peer-reviewed and published in a decent journal of high impact factor, as high impact factor as possible. And um, science is, you know, for many people, the holy grail of um, publications. And um, it's disappointing to see such an article being published uh, in science, whereby the quality of the components of it are very poor. But it seems to be that if you are a well-known researcher, and Hegarty is, and, and to be honest, Hegarty is, is somebody that I respect deeply in terms of their academic output, just not this particular article, this particular theory. Um, you know, it seems to be when you have the power of a, of, a, of a big university, a big research team, a big research budget behind you, you can publish all sorts of crazy stuff in really high impact factor journals and, you know, get away with it, seemingly. Whereas I think, you know, if a, if a smaller research team or independent researcher tried to publish something with this um, model, you know, it wouldn't have got past the peer review stage. But there we are. Maybe it's just bitterness on my behalf. I don't know. But I feel like I'm speaking from some experience. And so, yeah, I waited for some feedback on that genetic uh, component, which, which wasn't good. Namely, I was waiting for the opinion of Davidsky over at Eurogene's blog, who has written extensively about ancient DNA and Indo-European migrations. And um, also has helped me personally with arguably one of the best um, analysis or modelings of my personal uh DNA that I've ever had compared to like these big testing companies like Ancestry DNA, 23andMe. Um, the particular model that Davidsky uses uh, seems to correlate with my known paper trail almost perfectly. Um, and so I, you know, I respect him as a computer scientist, a mathematician, and a geneticist. And it was good to get uh, his opinion on this article. And Summarising his opinion, I think he said something on his blog like it, it seems to be that they had an idea for a model and wanted to force the genetics to agree with that idea. And it's interesting because my perspective on the linguistic component is, is very similar. The sign of a good paper for me on Indo-European languages, cultures, origins, things like that, is the Trinity model that they have a good incorporation, a good consideration of the genetics, the linguistics and the archaeology. And in this particular model presented by Hegarty, the, you know, TLDR version of the model is that there were two distinct 
Indo-European migrations. There was a, a group, a southern group, that broke away from this steppe group. And this southern group subsequently broke off um, and gave us the migrations that were responsible for the diffusion of the Anatolian and the Greek language families, for example. And the problem with that hypothesis is that it doesn't really correlate with the archaeology and it doesn't correlate with the genetics and it doesn't really correlate with the um, linguistics. Why they've decided to come up with this um, model, I have no idea. Maybe it's because it's kind of like the best of both worlds because we had this um, steppe model that diffused from like the Ukraine Russian steppe area. And we have this other idea, this other theory that perhaps they diffused from somewhere in or around Anatolia with uh, migrating groups of farmers. Recently, with advances in archaeology and um, genetics, it seems to be that the step hypothesis is pretty much the model that we need to be working with. Of course, there are tweaks that we need to or kinks that we need to um, get out of the model and the model needs certain tweakings but more or less that's that's where we are and and I, I, I see that it's been a, a great interdisciplinary effort over the past few years to like really um, add the finishing touches to this model and now to come up with this hybrid model I think um, really does a disservice to all three academic disciplines. But ideally, you would want this this trinity, right? And my main criticism of this particular article is that it mentions archaeology and doesn't consider the archaeology at all. Um, so, you know, it fails there immediately. It doesn't seem to have got the genetics right. So that's two thirds of the trinity now broken. And I'm going to talk about the linguistics just to finish it off. Well, let's talk about some, something positive, because I do respect Hegarty and his team, and they've identified one key problem with the type of linguistics that they're doing in this paper, which is based on, you know, lists of cognates and very complex um, analysis of these co cognate lists between branches of Indo-European uh, languages. And they identified that one key issue with a lot of papers that have gone before is that it's the, the cognate list is very individual. It's idiosyncratic. It's chosen essentially by one person. And they even quoted a few people. Um, that have done this. And it's true. You know, I'll hold my hands up. I was attempting to do a second paper this year on cognate lists in the African languages that I'm interested in. And I abandoned this idea because I felt it very, I found it very difficult to come up with a good cognate list. But they've identified that one key issue is to, to remove this, um, the individualism from the creation of these cognate lists. And they've stated that they've used over 80 linguists and native speakers in order to produce this 170 meaning list of items which will be compared between the branches of Indo-European languages, modern and ancient, uh, to come up with their fine grain analysis. Generally, the identification and the attempt to tackle this problem is great. It's fantastic. And they get my respect for that. You know, we've got it. We do have to try and... Um, fix that as a problem in many linguistics papers. But the way that they've done it, I think they haven't actually fixed this problem at all. Because for one, it kind of makes no, no sense to me why they feel the need to incorporate, you know, the input of certain native speakers, and they don't clarify whether they have a linguistic background or not, in the analysis of, or in the creation of cognate lists for less well-known modern Indo-European languages. Let's say, you know, some particular branch of um, or sister or brother language to Farsi, for example. Maybe you can't find a trained linguist that knows this uh, particular language well. So you, you get an expert in the branch and pair them up with a native speaker and set them off coming up with their cognate list. That's great. But, you know, what do you do with Luvian, for example? Good luck trying to find a native speaker of Luvian in 2023. So it seems to be that this type of the way that they've tried to come up with their cognate list seems to be biased towards modern languages anyway, although I might be misunderstanding the, the methodology there. One key flaw of their methodology is that regardless of how many experts they use to come up with this cognate list, the data is curated by a relatively small number of people. And I discovered that when I was checking out the database where they, where they keep all this data. By, in fact, as far as I can tell, one person. One person in the, I checked the Italic languages, the Celtic languages, 
the Anatolian languages, the Greek languages, and I could see that one person, one person's name was responsible for creating this, this data. And I think that that you're now reinserting the problem that you tried to remove by incorporating the opinions of 80 people because you've got 80 opinions now curated by a very small number of people, which puts back that problem that you tried to get rid of. I have no idea why that decision was made, but I disagree with some of the reasoning that's given in this database by um, this one particular linguist regarding the inclusion or exclusion of certain uh, certain items and things like this. For example, if we just take Anatolian, which I've looked at in a bit more detail, some key items are completely missing, like the meaning for to libate or libation, shipant in Hittite. Uh, it's attested, I think, in the Germanic language family and the um, Italic language family as well. It's just not there in the cognate list. Why it wouldn't be, I don't know. For it to exist in Anatolian language family, Italic and Germanic, would indicate that there must be a Proto-Indo-European reconstruction there somewhere, but it's not there. And for example, the Hittite word for cloud, Alpa, was categorized as only having an origin at the level of the Hittite uh, branch in the Indo-European family tree and not being, uh, not deriving from a Proto-Indo-European term, which is crazy for me because I believe in 2012, a researcher called Woodhouse out of an Australian Institute wrote a great paper, um, which I'm, I'll try to remember to link in the description, which gives five or six plausible etymologies for Alpa um, in Proto-Indo-European. Uh, so just because we might not have the exact um, etymology in Proto-Indo-European doesn't mean that there isn't one and that you know any one of those six could be a good uh, etymology. And, and to be honest, I, it was a very thorough paper with very you know solid science behind it. So why this would be ignored, I don't know. Is it incompetence? The researchers responsible for the curation of the data in Hegarty's paper just didn't know about the paper or they chose to ignore it? I don't know. Either way, I would say that that example of Alper in Hittite, it has a, a plausible, a reasonably solid, as far as Indo-European reconstructions go, why it would be categorized as um, originating at the Hittite or Anatolian branch level, I, I really have no idea. Maybe one of the people who worked on the article could explain it for me. I also feel that the cognate list in and of itself, the, it's 170 meanings that they've come up with. Again, I've, I've tried to do similar articles in the past. That number is small. I understand the difficulties with coming up with a, with a reliable list, but 170 is, is a small number to try to derive reliable and robust. You know, the article constantly uses the word robust. And I think, how can you say that your data is robust with 170 meanings only? I mean, of that, that's 170 meanings, the, the maximum amount, Hittite only includes 140, and Mycenaean has like less than... 40 i think 39 that's a very small number of meanings for some languages and yeah you know to robustness isn't the word i would use to describe conclusions based on on this type of um on this type of data unfortunately you know what else doesn't make sense in the article well Tokarian, they seem to be implying that for thousands of years for 2000 years it was relatively unchanged until the 9th century ad when it was last attested and um, that seems odd why they would suggest that this this hybrid model, the fact that it suggests that Greek and Anatolian must have split off together to give this southern um, cluster of languages where we get this hybrid uh, divergence from doesn't make sense linguistically because Anatolian looks like a very early branch of Proto-Indo-European. Greek looks like a very late branch of proto Euro Indo-European. So how they can be both branching off from this main step group together, moving south and then subsequently branching off later, um, I have no idea how they, you know, why they would think that that is plausible because it really doesn't agree with a lot of the linguistic evidence that we have. Uh, but here we go. That's what the article suggests. And in fact, I'm looking at the diagrams now. Um, yeah. They're suggesting that the Anatolian and, and, and Greek Armenian emigrated from a, uh, an eastern 
Nexus into Anatolia and subsequently into where um, modern day Greece occupies. I would say that that's highly unlikely and I'm reasonably sure that archaeology would state that that's very, very unlikely. Timelines in general are crazy in the paper. Everything seems to be occurring way too early than it, it can on a linguistic level or archaeological level. Um, so there's that. I'm not sure about the genetic timelines. And then there's, you know, I, I might have mentioned it previously. I definitely mentioned it to somebody. That there's the fact that the article is just not written very well. There's some very confusing sentences, double negatives, where you really need to think what the author is trying to say. And then there's just weird statements like old Icelandic is not ancestral to modern Icelandic. That might not be word for word, but it's, it's something like that. And um, I, un I actually understand what they're, what they're trying to say. And all ling linguists know this. What they're saying is that the specific dialect or specific register that old Icelandic sagas were written in is not necessarily the thing that evolved to give us the you know the range of dialects and registers that is modern Icelandic yeah of course and I think every linguist knows that you know when we look at like monumental Celtic inscriptions or you know Hittite cuneiform used in administrative texts we're not saying that this is the the, the the register the vocab choice the grammar that necessarily people would use when they're talking to their mates across the street or something and of course, all of these registers dialects evolved together to give us the, the modern day variants of, this, of these languages. And linguists know this and we accommodate this thinking into our modelling. I think it doesn't help anybody by stating things like old Icelandic is not ancestral to modern Icelandic. Because of course, it, it is in the sense that the, the dialect and the register that gave us old English will have been part of a wider continuum. And that has evolved into modern day English. I think sometimes the issue comes with the fact that we use a tree as the model for the um, diffusion, divergence of dialects which become different languages in family trees. The one that we're talking about here being the Indo-European language family tree. But it's not a tree and it's not like a genealogical tree. That's not how it works. It's much more complicated than that. You've got dialects and registers and uh, uh, continuums that are constantly in flux, influencing each other. And it's not like that th this string or this branch or this twig that gave us old Icelandic literature is just one twig and it's completely uh, individual, discrete, atomized, not connected with that twig which eventually grew into modern Icelandic. It's not like that. And that's the the drawback of the image, the model image that we have in our head. and But I don't know why the Hegarty has felt the need to talk about languages in such a way. I think it, it doesn't do a service to people who are, who are reading this article. It sounds very odd um, and, you know, a little bit dumb, to be honest. And I, I'm not, I don't want to sound bitter or anything, but it sounds like a dumb thing to be in a research article in science but you know maybe that's why i'm not being published in science so yeah that would be my conclusion i don't think that the hybrid model of the indo-european languages or um, the diffusion of indo-european languages is necessarily a thing or in fact based in any semblance of historical reality uh, but nevertheless, we have an article published on it. Um, I do recommend you to go, go out and read it. Like I said, the, the, uh, the idea, the foundational idea is a good one. And it's something that we do need to work upon in linguistics in general. And incorporating more um, genetic evidence, archaeological evidence is always a good thing. The fact, again, that they would mention archaeology and completely ignore it is just very odd for me. So... By all means, go and check out the article. Also read other people's critiques on it. I'm sure if you just Googled it or go onto Eurogenes, there's a very succinct uh, criticism of the article there. What are your opinions? Am I wrong? Am I a complete pleb and missing, you know, the key methodological saving grace of this article? Are my interpretations uh, completely off point? You know, let me know in the comment section. I'll be interested to get your feedback. 
Um, but yeah, um, I don't think too highly of this article, although I do think highly of, of the author. Let's see what they come out with next. That's all from me for today. It's been a pleasure to spend a few moments uh, moaning to you. Um, I hope you found some logic in what I've said and it's made sense. Have a great day wherever you are, whatever you're doing, and I'll speak to you soon about some more Hittite-based goodness. All the best and bye for now.